Here is the first video in another project that I am going to do about a duplex apartment building and this is something I haven't done yet. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. We have the exact same building on the left side here as we do on the right side, making our job a little easier to build it and figure out all the materials. And since this is a modern day duplex, we are going to have a space in between the buildings. And that space is usually a one inch minimum, along with a one or a two hour firewall. And that firewall might need to go all the way from the top of the building foundation to the bottom of the roof sheathing. Just in case a fire breaks out on this side, it's not gonna burn down this side. Let's go ahead and take a look at the garages. We have two one-car garages with a entry into the building, washer and dryer area, along with a tankless water heater. We come into the kitchen, sink, refrigerator, stove, cabinets, pantry, and then we can come around front door here, a little porch, a coat closet here, come into one of the bedrooms, closet, for the bedroom and not a bad size bedroom. Then we have one bathroom come in here to the other bedroom and then a larger closet. And in our gable roof design, we will have a gable in the front here, gable on the side, gable on the side over here, and then two valleys here. And that will look something like this, two garage doors in the front, a porch on each side, same window locations in the garage and in the bedroom over here, same with this side of the house, and same with the back. Everything will be in proportion and have the same measurements on both sides, like I said. And next up, let's go ahead and take a look at the hip roof. We're going to have a couple of hips coming off of the same spots where we had the gable roof, same corners over here, along with the same valleys on each side. And that will look something like this. If you want this design here, I know that your stucco contractor will appreciate it a little more with this design here. Won't have to go up the high gable walls. And this is actually one of the reasons why I design buildings with hip roofs when I'm going to be working and doing the stucco. Next up, let's go ahead and take the roofs off and kind of zoom in here. Give you an idea of what it might look like if we could remove the roof. And again, pantry way here, washer and dryer. We walk through into our kitchen and then we could have a dining room table here, small table with a couch and throw your TV either on this wall or this wall for your living room here, bedroom, bedroom, bathroom. And then of course your closet here, entry closet. Next up, let's go ahead and zoom in on some of these measurements here. And I might change some of the stuff when I do some of the framing. And of course, I will try to point that out if I do make any changes. And make sure that the bedrooms have at least one window for the fire egress. And I do have other videos on that or what they are. And of course, the window here is centered in between the two interior walls. And I think I just made a video on that centering windows and how the windows can be positioned on the interior of a building or even on the exterior of a building. Let me go ahead and go back here. And then of course I added a bathroom window here. I didn't have that in my first example. And we have two foot six inch or 30 inch doors going into the bedrooms. And I will also be providing a variety of different modifications to this building if I actually see enough interest from the viewers. If not, I won't worry about it. And I do understand that some of these videos don't start off real good. However, later on, they can gather quite a few views. And of course, you can pause this video at any time to stop and look at something that has piqued your interest. So let's go ahead and leave it at that. 
Here is another question that a couple of our viewers had, and I thought that I would try and clear it up in this video. And I've already made a couple of videos on how to design a gable roof. I will try to put some links in the video description box to those videos. And for the most part, what I suggested in those videos was dividing the base up into segments and then using a circle or a curve from a center point to figure out the locations where those roof rafters will connect to to create the most common gamble roof. And of course, that would look something like this. And I do realize that some people think that this will be a 45 degree angle, but that won't always be the case. And as far as I'm concerned, these angles can all vary. You do not need to use this particular method here where we simply divided everything up into six segments down here that are all equal sized and then used the first line on each side along with the center of the building with equal measurements on both sides and of course working within the realms of the curve here and i'm here to suggest that we don't need to do that you can divide it up into four six or eight even ten sections and I'm guessing that they will all need to be even because I haven't figured out how to do one where we would use five sections or seven sections or even three sections. And again, we're going to have the same height here on this side and on this side. And of course, these would be dictated by the curved layout if we are going to use that method. However, we could always get rid of the circle and then go ahead and just choose our own measurement here. So here we're going with the same distance here in width as we will be vertical, producing a 45 degree angle, and then went ahead and used the same measurement here up here to create the gamble roof that will not be using a curved or radius layout. And I can change these measurements if I want to, to create this type of design or change them again to create this design, or even change them again to create this type of design. So again, we don't need to use the curved layout method if we don't want to, or if it's actually going to be easier for you. And we don't even need to divide the building up into segments if we don't want to do that either. However, we are going to need to have the distance on each side from right to left or the outside of the building along with using the center line in the building so that our rafters will be the same sizes in hopes of designing something that will look like a gamble roof. Not too difficult, I hope. Make sure that this measurement and this measurement is the same this measurement and this measurement is the same and that these two measurements are the same and of course i will leave this measurement here up to you this measurement does not need to match anything unless we are going to be using our curved radius layout in this video we will take a look at the floor framing for our home with a wraparound porch to provide you with a little more information about this type of construction along with the locations of all of the floor beams and the floor joists. Now we are using truss joists in this example along with engineered lumber for all of our beams and the manufacturers for the truss joists also will provide you with some type of a rim joist material and as you will notice going through the video I don't think I have one beam that is not full bearing or sitting completely on top of the wall sometimes you will have the beam set back a little bit and then have the rim joist go through and most of the time either one of those methods will work for most engineers and in this video I will not be going over every single connection for the beams or the joist because you can always contact the product manufacturer for that information or your engineer however I will be providing you with close-ups and a little more information that I might have left out in the previous video. And one of those examples will be the double trimmer set I installed here, and I provided you with two different ways. Here we have a full length trimmer along with a shorter trimmer 
Over here we have two full length trimmers. And of course the key point will be to have two of those trimmers on each side if you're supporting a heavy load or even a post or something larger if the engineer needs it. And for those of you who are not familiar with my channel, these are only construction methods that might work. You might need to hire an engineer or contact your local building authorities for permits also. And all of the joists in this example will be 16 inches on center. And another thing I want to point out is that if I moved this wall over, I could make the beam shorter and probably go with a smaller beam if that would work for your particular project. And of course, this beam does need to be in this location to work structurally with the roof. So you're probably not going to have a choice of moving the beam back. However, you might be able to move the wall and have it sit under the beam and then simply put a structural footing in the floor foundation to transfer that load down to the ground like we have over here and over here. So you can get a pretty good idea how the beams are supported to create open spaces in the lower floor. Now if we take a look at this beam here, it's basically going to tie into this beam to create some type of a structural drag in the same way that we will be using this beam here to connect the back of the house from the front of the house. We can use these beams here to connect one side of the house to the other side of the house. And by doing that, we can use some type of a strap to connect the beams together. And for those of you wondering why in the heck this gap is here, that's because this beam here is going to sit on top of the subflooring. And we can use a hanger to support this beam here along with some straps to connect the beam to the supporting post. And this strap here will attach to the underside of the beam. And keep in mind that this is a small strap. You would probably need a much larger strap to connect the two beams together. So here we have a long drag structural connection that's going to make our engineer happy along with our joist hangers again spacing 16 inches on center and you might consider installing some web stiffeners and there is definitely more information about web stiffeners at the product manufacturer's website and in their installation instructions. I highly recommend reading the Trust Joyce, whatever joist you're going to be using, the product manufacturer's installation instructions if they have them. And of course, a view of how the rim joist is going to butt up against the beam. Again, the beam is full bearing, sitting on top of the three and a half inch wall, along with our ceiling backing here. Take a look here where we attached a 2x4 to the top of the wall framing so that we have some backing for our drywall so we can attach it to this board. Otherwise, our drywall is just going to be flopping around in the air. So another thing you can consider doing on your project. And in some cases, we will need to position the blocks in a certain spot to work with our subflooring. And you can see here where the subflooring is sitting half or centered on top of the block so that we can install the next subflooring to create a nice solid connection between the two floors or two sections of the floors. And I went ahead and ran these joists a little bit longer. I like doing this. However, you can always stop them here if that's going to work better for your project. And again, you can see here where we get a nice clean and smooth transition in these two sections where the subflooring plywood or OSB is switching directions. And of course the plywood switches directions because the joists are switching directions. And here's another thing you might want to do and that would be to extend the beam if you have a little bit extra to spare on the beam. If not, you can always stop the beam over here. If for example you had like a 14 foot beam and this is where the 14 foot section ended and I've been doing it for years. There's no need to order longer lumber to make something like this work. Just simply run it past a little bit so that you can get a little more bearing on the walls. And you can see here where I would have a difficult time attaching the hanger 
to the top of the beam if I stopped it even with the edge of the wall here. And that might not be that big of a deal. You could just simply adjust the layout to compensate. And again, another view of the long structural connection from the front of the house to the back of the house. And basically we're going to have something similar to it right here. And we're going to use another strap to connect the wall framing to the beam, along with some building hardware to connect the beams to the wall framing or even the other beams. And you can always use stronger connectors and an engineer might actually call out for different connectors. Keep that in mind. And this beam will help tie this wall together so that we get a nicer connection between the sides here. Even though that is not going to be the case right here, our stairway is going to create a problem for a connection that's going to run all the way through. And of course that might require additional structural reinforcement. So again, the joist changing directions. And if you have extra lumber, you can butt the joist up against the other joist or stop it at the end of the wall. And of course, our ceiling backing again, we can use a 2x6 instead of two 2x4s two here. If, of course, that will work for you. Everything in this video is just a suggested method of assembly. And if for your particular project it's going to work better to do something else, then I would say go for it. And with that said, if you have any suggestions about something that might work better, feel free to share those in the comment area. And again, we are going to use our blocks here to provide us with a change in the sheathing direction. And for the most part, this side is the same as the other side. And if you remember on the other side, this beam was sitting on top of the bay window opening with the large header. And if you do run into a situation where we have the window over a little bit, and it's going to work out better for us to have a solid post under the beam instead of putting a huge header over the window opening with double trimmers, whatever the deal is, think about whatever the reason is. If it needs to stay there, leave it. But if not, sometimes you can simply move a window either to the right or the left of a structural post a post support if that's going to work better for your project also. And most truss joists will be fastened to the top framing plates with either 16D nails that might be commons or sinkers or even different sizes. Again, 16 inch on center layout. Another way that you can finish this section here would be to extend the rim joist and kind of use it as a block up to the next joist here. And again, that would be if the lumber lengths allow it. Same on the other side here. Now we have another bay window, 45 degree angle on the joist here. And let's go ahead and take a look at it from the outside. So we have our rim joist again. The beam is full bearing post under it to provide us with a nice load transfer. 16 inch on center joist spacing that you're going to need to put some thought into if necessary. Keep in mind that some of these joists will need to be repositioned for a variety of different reasons. Plumbing, heating, and in some cases even electrical. Next up let's go ahead and install our floor sheathing. The direction of the floor sheathing is going to be running this way. Over here it's going to be running this way. Remember the joist switched directions there. And even though I cut this like this, this floor sheathing here can simply continue through. It doesn't need to break over here and it would probably work better if it did continue through especially if you're not going to have a problem with the stairway. And let's not forget that in this example here, we are going to need an overhang. We're going to need to extend the floor sheathing so that our tread overhang will work. We are going to have a one inch nosing or a one inch overhang for our stair treads. And that means we're going to need it up here also. 
And of course, you will need to switch directions here. Now, if you can see here, I don't have the floor sheathing breaking half on the joist or even half on the stringer. This isn't going to be a big deal because it's going to basically be supported by the stringer. And I doubt if anyone's ever going to put their foot over here. However, you can always break it on the joist. I will leave that up to you. So again, the floor sheathing here can continue all the way through if it's not going to create a problem for the stairs. Sometimes the floor sheathing will break over here and you'll need to add a block under the floor sheathing or reposition one of the stringers underneath the break. And if you did something like that incorrectly, you could end up with a squeak in the floor here. And of course, the floor sheathing switches directions only in this area here and the two areas in the front or these sections here. So the grain of the plywood or the OSB is basically going to be running in this direction here, this direction here, this direction here, and it's going to switch in these two directions here. Here is a problem that a couple of our viewers have had when pouring their concrete driveways, walkways, and patios in sections. And you're not going to have this problem if you're just going to pour a small slab. It's not going to connect to anything. However, if it is going to connect to something and you just go ahead and form a small section, pour it, reuse the form boards, move them over, pour another section, reuse the form boards to pour your next section and so on, then you might or might not end up with this problem here. And that would be a variation or difference in the height between your existing and your new concrete. And something like this won't be a problem if you can raise the form boards and create a small gentle slope between the new section of concrete you poured and the existing section of concrete that you're not going to be able to raise or lower. However, this isn't going to be you because you're watching this video. You are going to form the entire section and find any problems that you have before and not while you're working on the project. And I do understand that we're looking at a section that you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, this shouldn't be a problem. However, that wouldn't be the case if you were trying to connect the driveway. You're trying to get a nice slope going all the way to the street without needing to slope it off to the side or set up some type of a site drainage system, something that require even more money than my original suggestion of forming the entire project before you pour it in sections. And again, sometimes by forming the entire project, you're going to be able to solve a problem you can't see until you've actually put some of the pieces of the puzzle together. In this video, I will provide you with an example of how you can build a gable roof on this side of a home addition instead of a hip roof. And I won't be going through the entire process because I've pretty much explained everything in this video and I will put a link to that video in the comment area and in that video I have a lot more information and step-by-step -step instructions on how to build this type of roof here and keep in mind that this is a home addition if we go to the other side of the building this is what your building might look like without the home addition and of course this is what it would look like with the home addition and the hip roof so the first thing I want to do is remove some of the ceiling joists. We are not going to be using this setup here. And instead, we will simply run our ceiling joist through all the way to the end. And we will need to have a longer board for our ridge instead of stopping it around here somewhere for the hip rafters. And again, I think you're going to get enough information out of the two videos to figure out what it might look like or could look like even though I'm not going to be providing you with step-by-step -step instructions because I have so many other videos about building roofs and home additions at our website so definitely go there and check out some of those videos especially if you're looking for more information on how to figure out the lengths of the roof rafters and where to position them along with the ceiling joist and a view of the rafter blocks 
from the bottom here and then of course a view of them from above and the ceiling joists and the rafters will usually connect to the wall framing plates with 16 D nails and some of them will need to be angled while others will be driven through the ceiling joist into the side of the roof rafter straight on through in the same way that you would be attaching the fascia board to the roof rafters. And in this video we are going to be installing straps over the sheathing instead of collar ties as a replacement for the collar ties. And of course you will need to install some gable studs and whether or not they line up exactly with the studs below I will leave that up to you. And don't forget in some cases you are going to need a gable vent or roof dormer vents to allow for attic air circulation and I'm starting to wonder if we're ever going to get rid of that it seems like there are a lot of problems created in colder climates from the moisture in the air that might freeze in your attic and then thaw out in the springtime creating some type of water damage along with some of the newer spray foam insulation techniques that people are using and of course we will need some backing here ceiling backing for the drywall and we can use a 2x4 for that instead of a larger piece of lumber like a 2x6 that we are using for our ceiling joist and if you are going to use this design make sure that the ridge extends past the side of the rafters or the end of the wall framing so that you can attach the fascia board to it and that would look something like this without the lookouts installed and I'm going to provide you with two different assembly methods for the lookouts and the first one on the list will be to move the rafters back along with the ceiling joist so that we can get a little longer board in here that might help with our cantilever and I'm not a hundred percent sure that you can't leave the rafters in their original location and have everything work out properly or that you'll ever have a problem with the fascia board sagging and another thing I did was moved the ceiling joist to the other side I'm still within my six 16 inch on center measurements here between the ceiling joist and the ceiling backing and the reason why I did this was to get a little better nailing for the lookout here however I'm pretty sure you'd be able to nail this into the ceiling joist if it was on the other side without much of a problem and another thing you could do would be to end nail through the block here into the lookout if you were looking for a little more structural support so here we have 32 inch on center lookouts and that's usually going to be the maximum spacing for this type of design however you might consider adding more of them these are spaced 12 inches on center and we're using the original location of the rafter however I do not know if this is going to work in your area and of course you would need to check with your local building authorities to validate all of the information in this video anyway and let's not forget that I will not be able to provide you with lumber sizes or structural engineering for your projects also and to wrap this video up we can go ahead and install our roof sheathing and as I often point out in my videos you might need to have a piece larger than 24 inches for your roof sheathing suggesting that this board would need to stop over here and then a piece would need to extend all the way over to the fascia board from here if that was actually going to be at least 24 inches long and this would have been something specified by your structural engineer on the home building plans and after we have installed our roof sheathing we can install our straps and these straps will be replacing the collar ties and the spacing on these straps is 32 inches on center and most of the time the spacing is going to be 48 inches on center that is a maximum spacing you could always make the spacing smaller you just can't make it larger and sometimes by simply adding one more strap you can reduce the length of the spacing to create something a little stronger so there it is the gable roof home edition instead of a hip roof home edition for this particular design 
In this video, I will provide you with the basic information you're going to need to add a landing at the bottom of a stairway. Now, the first thing you're going to need to do will be to remove the first riser in some cases or the first tread. Now, you won't need to remove these all the time. However, in our example, we are going to remove them and measure the height of the stringer that sits on top of the treated lumber. And if yours is not sitting on top of treated lumber, you can simply grab a piece of treated lumber, butt it up against the stairway, and then measure the distance. And in this example here, we have five and a quarter inches. And that will be the height of our floor joist. So we're going to need to cut a two by six that is usually five and a half inches tall down to five and a quarter inches as long as we're going to be using a full inch and a half piece of lumber for our sill plates. Next thing, let's go ahead and draw the perimeter of the landing. And of course, your design can be different. Then we're going to cut our base framing plates or the plates that our five and a quarter inch tall lumber will be sitting on. Now you can fasten these to concrete with some type of a wedge anchor, framing anchor like this one, that will require you to drill a hole in the concrete. Or you can also use some type of epoxy and all threads. And in some cases, you might be able to get away with using a shot and a pin. This is a type of nail that can be driven into the concrete with a tool that can usually be purchased fairly inexpensive or rented from your local rental yard. And if you are going to be attaching this to a wood framed floor, you can usually use nails or screws and even put some type of an adhesive underneath the framing plate. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to position all of the pins or the framing anchors in a location where they will not interfere with your rim joist or your floor joist. And to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about, let's go ahead and install the rim joist on each side. And if for whatever reason you need to notch any of the framing components for the floor joist or the rim joist here, that's usually not going to be that big of a deal. But you can see here where all of the pins are located in an area where they are not going to be underneath any of the other joist or the rim joist. So if you can avoid that, make sure that you do. And you can fasten the joist to the framing plates with a toenail or an angled nail, usually a 16D. And I will leave it up to you whether you use a common or a sinker nail. And let's not forget that you might need to check with your local building department to verify whether or not you can actually make this modification to your property, as I try to mention in most of my videos. And of course, you can end nail the joist through the ledger with 16D nails also. I usually like to install three for 2x6 or 2x8 and then four for a 2x10 or a 2x12 joist. And if for whatever reason you're using a 2x4, two nails should work for that. And of course, the rim joist can be toenailed about 16 inch on center spacing for the nails to attach it to the framing plates. And after you have secured all of the framing, you can go ahead and install the floor sheathing. And in our case here, we are using the same thickness, three quarters of an inch thick sheathing, the same thickness as our treads. If you are going to use materials with different thicknesses, make sure that you adjust accordingly. For example, if I was going to use inch and an eighth material, I would need to lower this another three eighths of an inch to prevent riser variations in the stairway or different height steps. And another thing you might consider doing will be to put an overhang in the area that will be used to step down off of the platform onto the floor. And that would look something like this. The same overhang that we have here will be the one that we are using on the stairway. One inch overhang for the stair steps, one inch for the landing. And you don't need to put this on the landing if you don't want to. However, the step down will usually look better 
if it matches the stairs. And obviously you will not need it in any area that will be up against a wall or a section of the landing that you will not be using to step down off of the landing. So if you're going to be able to step down off the landing in this direction and in this direction here, then you might consider using a one inch overhang all the way around the deck. Another thing you might consider doing will be to bring the landing out to where it lines up with either the first step or the front of a riser. If this will work better for your design instead of coming back a little bit and then over. And of course, consider making the landing a little shorter. If this landing was about an inch shorter, we wouldn't have this small piece here. However, that won't work out all the time and you might need to make adjustments to the sheathing or to the joist. And of course, we can change the direction of the floor sheathing if that's going to work better for us along with the floor joist. And you can always add one or more of the base framing plates if you want to make the floor a little stronger. And I've actually done something like this when using 2x4 joist, if that might work better for your project. And for those of you who have noticed, we have cut the ends of the stringer off so that we could butt the joist up against the stringer. And again, another idea that you can use if that's going to work better. And as always, if you have any questions at all about this type of framing, feel free to leave those questions in the comment area and I will answer them as soon as possible. And of course, you can see here where the height is exactly the same for our newly remodeled platform. And something like this will definitely make the building inspector happy. Here is another video that I've been wanting to make for quite some time, and it's going to have something to do with saving you lots of money. And I repeat, lots of money, sometimes thousands of dollars. And I've even seen projects where emergency repairs can be over $10,000 if you need to call them immediately and have them come out there in the middle of the night. And in this video, I will provide you with a couple of things that you can do to control your emergency plumbing situation. Whether or not it's a water supply problem or a drainage problem most of the time. So let's go ahead and start with the drainage pipes. And this is usually going to have something to do with a clog somewhere in your plumbing that is creating your bathtub, toilet, or sink to overfill onto your floors and in some cases create an emergency situation. And I'm here to tell you that if you know where your drain pipe cleanouts are, or if in some cases you don't have them, but you get them installed so that you don't end up dealing with an emergency situation, then it could end up saving you a few dollars. So let's go ahead and pretend like the water is filled up in the drainage pipes and has somehow gotten into the bathtub, but not overflowing out of the toilet or out of the sinks. To provide you with an example of how the plumbing pipes could fill up all the way across the line here. So this line right here represents the top of the water level in the pipes. And this is the reason why you don't have water coming out of the bathtub or the sinks. It's going to be coming out of the lowest spot possible. And that's usually going to be your bathtub, your shower, or bottom of the toilet if the seal isn't working properly. And this is actually something that happened to me about uh, five or six years ago and I did not have any clean outs to open. However, this isn't always going to be a problem. You've got to continue to put water into the drain pipes in order for it to continue flowing out or leaking from another low spot. So pay attention here. In order to prevent you from calling an emergency plumber, simply quit using your toilets, sinks, and bathtubs. Otherwise, water is going to continue to flow out of these areas unless the plumbing pipes are only partially clogged somewhere. So a drainage pipe problem usually isn't going to require emergency plumbing services. However, a water supply problem might. And we'll talk about that in a second. Let's go ahead and remove some of this stuff here so that we can take a look at the plumbing and I can provide you with a little more information about what's happening underneath your floor and in the walls. 
And that's usually going to look like this. Let's just say that I have a clog here and it's not allowing any water or debris to go out of the pipe. Then it's only a matter of time before the plumbing pipes over here fill up with water and will leak out of the lowest spot, which in this situation here is going to be the wash machine drain line. So if I have a clog here and I use the kitchen sink above, then there's a good chance the water from this pipe will just simply fill up these pipes and gravity will do its job and allow the water from here to come out of here. However, if we do not have something located here and this is the lowest spot, the bathtub, then every time I use either one of the sinks or the toilet, I'm going to allow for water to go into this pipe. And since it's not going to be draining out, it's actually going to fill up the rest of the pipes and allow it to go into the lowest spot possible. And hopefully by now you're starting to wrap your mind around what I'm talking about. And it really is going to depend on where the plumbing pipe is clogged up as to whether or not you're going to be able to just simply open up one of the clean outs. And even though your city or your county might not appreciate this, it might prevent you again from calling an emergency plumber or ruining your home. So if you know where your cleanouts are located and you have a problem where water is backing up in a bathtub, simply go down and open up one of the cleanouts. And if all of the water drains out of that cleanout, then that will give you a pretty good idea that this section of the pipe is not plugged. And the same would hold true if I went down and I opened up this clean out here. If I open it up and all the water from here drains out into my front yard, then I'm going to have a pretty good idea that none of this here is plugged and that the problem is going to be located in front of the clean out or in between this section of the plumbing and where it hooks up to a septic tank or the sewer pipe. So again, if you have clean outs and they're located outside of the home and they aren't going to create a problem, simply open them up. And if it's in the middle of the night or nine o'clock on a Sunday and you understand what I'm talking about in this video, then you will not require emergency plumbing services and instead will be able to contact a plumber the next day during normal working hours. Next up, let's go ahead and take a look at the water supply. This is going to be easier as long as you know where the shutoff valve is to your home. And this is usually going to be a valve that if it is working properly, you're just simply going to be able to turn it in one direction or rotate it in a certain direction to stop the water to the entire house. So this is very important. However, it's got to be working properly. And in some cases, it wouldn't be a bad idea to make sure that it is. Shut it off and then go into your house and make sure that water isn't leaking out of one of the faucets that you have open. Obviously, it's not going to work if the faucet is shut. However, this won't be the end all here. If that isn't working, you can usually go to the water meter where the water company will have a shutoff valve located on either one side or both sides of the water meter. And even this can be difficult if you haven't done it before. Do the homework. Make sure that you know where the water shutoff valves are and that they are working. And the same will hold true for your cleanouts. Make sure that you know where the lowest point of the plumbing drain pipe is going to be. The cleanouts that might be necessary to open if you're having a problem with a drain pipe clog. Also, make sure that you can open them and that you have the correct tools to open them and you know where those tools are located so you won't have to look for them during an emergency. And I can't stress this enough, emergency plumbing services can usually be eliminated by simply knowing where to shut off the water. Because if there isn't any more water going into the house, then you're not going to have any more water entering into the drains either. In this video, we are going to add a small 7 foot by 12 foot patio. And this will be a covered patio to the front of our 434 square foot house. And this will involve pouring a concrete slab 
and removing some of the roofing and the roof sheathing. Now the first thing I want to point out is that you might not need to remove as much of the roof sheathing as I did and I will leave it up to you, your best judgment on what you need to remove to actually build the roof. And along with the roof sheathing you will need to remove some of the rafter blocks just don't remove more than you need. For example, once you get over into this section here, you might want to leave this block and leave some of the fascia board sticking out a little longer than you think it might need to be. In other words, if you cut it over here and it needs to be about three inches longer, you're not going to be happy with yourself. Now we're going to use a framing square to square up the patio and in order to do that you will simply set one side of the framing square up against the building and the other side up against your form board. And another thing that might vary in your area is this two inches and that is usually going to be the minimum distance between the top of your floor or the top of the concrete foundation and the top of your patio. However, these sizes can be different, especially if you're dealing with ADA access. So once we have the form board nice and square, we can drive a couple of stakes into the ground and then grab our trusty level to level it off. And once it is level, we will be able to mark this stake over here. We're just simply going to draw a line across the top of it so that we can figure out how far to drop this end of the form board to create a one quarter of an inch per foot slope in our form board. And since we're coming out seven feet and a quarter of an inch per foot is the minimum, I'm going to go ahead and drop it an extra quarter of an inch to create two inches of slope but if you did the math it would come out to one and three quarter inches and then after you have that done you can set the rest of your form boards and dig out whatever you need for your concrete patio slab and in our case we're going to have a footing at each end this is going to be 12 inches by 12 inches and then 12 inches deep next up we will set our rebar and it's going to be spaced 18 inches on center in both directions and if you're planning on building the patio with the house then you could always extend the rebar into the original footing and even tie it to the rebar in the original foundation. If not, you might need to drill some holes and dowel the rebar into the footing. However, this might not be necessary. You could simply install the rebar and space it 18 inches on center or 24 inches on center. And I am using number four rebar or half inch rebar. And we will also be installing some type of post base connectors. And you can usually find these at your local lumber yards. And they're going to base basically center into our footing and your footing sizes might need to be different also. So not too difficult. Let's go ahead and pan out. And there's our rebar. Next up we will pour the concrete patio slab and strip the forms of course. Take a look at our post base connector, which should be about a quarter of an inch off the ground. I like to pour the concrete to the bottom of the metal here, but I have seen people raise them up a little bit if they need to. Now, in order to figure out the height of the posts that are going to sit in the connectors I just showed you, I think you could actually just grab a two by four, set it on top of the patio foundation, and then go all the way up to the top of the wall, and then subtract the height of the beam from either the two by four or the measurement that you got. And in our scenario, we are going to be using a four by eight beam. And my thought for something like this is the fact that we have a quarter of an inch slope on the patio slab already. And if we want the roof to slope a quarter of an inch per foot, then we can use this measurement right here to create a quarter of an inch per foot slope on the bottom and the top. And you should always check the measurements. Here we have seven foot seven and three sixteenths. And I believe most building codes require a minimum of six foot 10 inches. So in reality, we have plenty of room here. If I wanted to change the pitch of the roof to a half inch per foot, all I would need to do is take two inches 
off the top of the post. If I wanted to make a one inch per foot slope, I would simply adjust the post accordingly. And I believe that would be six more inches. And that would still provide us with over seven foot one inches of headroom clearance and help the water drain off of the roof a little faster. And of course, make sure that you have all of these calculations done before and not after you install your post. However, it might be better for you to put the post and beam into place if you're having a difficult time wrapping your mind around what I'm trying to do to figure out the slope of the roof rafters. The next step will be to place some type of a straight edge or your roof rafter or even a 2x4 or a 2x6 on top of the beam and on top of the framing plates to check the slope of the roof rafter. So not going to be too difficult to do. Just simply grab a level and in this case we're using a two foot long level and if we have a quarter of an inch per foot slope then the distance between the bottom of the level and the top of the roof rafter should be a half of an inch. And for example if we had a one foot long level then the distance should be a quarter of an inch. If we had a four foot long level then it should be one inch. And another Another thing I do when building patios like these to speed up the process will be to nail one of the roof rafters into place at each end and then level or vertically plumb up the posts so that they are plumb in this direction or vertically straight. And even though I showed you this method, you might be better off just simply bracing all of the posts up and plumbing up the posts in both directions by using some type of bracing like this. And then setting your straight edge or your roof rafters on top to check to see if it's got the right slope. And again, use whatever is easier for you. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the connection here where you will need to make sure that it is lapped on the right side or should I say the correct side of the ceiling joist because I actually built this model and had them lapped on the wrong side and I will show you what I'm talking about here in a few seconds and here is another cut you might need to get creative with you can install the patio rafter like this and then notch around it or just have the patio rafter sitting on top an inch and a half or two inches keep in mind that the minimum distance that a rafter can sit on top of a framing plate is probably going to be an inch and a half. So another thing that might help you when building your patio roof. And just another view to show you that the gable studs will also help to support the rafter here. If for whatever reason you believe you might have cut too much out of the rafter and it doesn't seem like a nice structural connection. Next up we will install all of our roof rafters and our pressure blocks. And we're going to set the blocks on top of the beam and they are going to go even or flush with the outside of the beam. And all of our roof rafters are going to be 16 inches on center and they are not going to have any seat cuts notched into them because the slope of the roof isn't really that steep or steep enough in my opinion to require one. But again, I will leave that up to you if that is a design modification you want to install on your project. Now let's take a look at the blocking here. And in this case, we're going to bring it out past, if you have siding or stucco, maybe it can go out past that a little bit. And this is going to help us create a nice finished edge at the bottom here. And as I mentioned earlier, when I said that you need to make sure that these joists are located on the correct side, you can see here that there's not going to be a problem with this one or this one or this one, but if this one was located on this side of the ceiling joist, the rafter would be in the way. And you could run into this same problem with roof trusses or other types of framing that might require some type of layout modifications for the location of your patio roof rafters. So for example, you might have 24 inch on center roof rafters like we have here, and 16 inch on center ceiling joist like we have here. And if 
for whatever reason the layout measurements for these rafters or ceiling joists change, then you might need to change the layout measurements on these also. Next up, let's go ahead and install our fascia board. And this is probably going to be about the trickiest part of this entire project. However, by providing you with a few examples of it, you should be able to figure it out. And we're simply going to set this piece of fascia board on top of the framing plate to provide it with a nice strong connection. It's sitting on something solid. I know some carpenters might want to cut it here, but that's not always going to provide us with the best structural connection. Same thing here. And depending upon how far away this is from the other rafter, you might need to run this up a little further and create some type of a cantilever. Put our blocks in there and our blocks of course are going to line up with the blocks on this side with this roof and the blocks over here will line up with the other side. We can see here from the bottom how they are lining up and how they are lining up on the other side. So we have a nice clean finish there. And since this is only about eight feet, I'm not worried about putting any outlookers in here. And I've done this plenty of times where it seemed like it was nice and strong. View of the blocking and the fascia board there, using two by eight for the fascia board. And this might be a more difficult cut for you to make. And I might even make another video on that. And if I get enough people requesting it in the comment area, I will definitely make another video on how to join these two pieces of fascia board together. And of course, the final phase for building a patio like this would be to install the roof sheathing. Except for the fact that I ran into a problem here. Now, I didn't modify this. I could have easily made this plywood bigger with my modeling program, but I didn't want to do that. All of this stuff is to scale. And when I was all done installing the plywood here, I'm almost an inch short if I line it up with the front here. However, since the fascia board is an inch and a half thick and I'm still going to be able to get my perimeter nailing in here, I could simply move the plywood back, put a rip strip in the front, and everything should work out just fine. So this would be one way to solve this problem. Another thing you could do would be to simply grab your measuring tape and measure from here to here and see what the measurement is because you might be able to just bring the fascia your board back an inch or two, whatever you need to solve that problem. And hopefully that makes sense. Now I'm going to go ahead and go a little faster through this section of the video because it's running a little long. So Another thing you can do will be to extend the length of the patio roof rafter so that you can get more nailing into the ceiling joist or the roof trusses, whatever you're going to be nailing it into. And another method might be to extend the block here a little farther so that you can add a little more structural support to this section of the fascia board. Or you can use a wider piece of lumber and some joist hangers. And of course, this one here is definitely going to be stronger. However, it might not be aesthetically pleasing to some type of an architect or designer because you got this big chunk of wood here. So again, just something else you can do to make what would otherwise be a structurally weak part of the roof framing into some something a little stronger. And we could always make this connection a little stronger by extending the beam a little further and then placing a block on top of it and then nailing the fascia board into the block. And another thing you can do would be to chamfer the edges here. And we will take a look at the other side to give you an idea of what the chamfered edges would look like if you don't like that square look. And here we've extended the beam a little further past the fascia board so that the fascia board sits on top of the beam. And that is it for the video. Let's go ahead and wrap it up by just providing you with a few more views. Give you an idea of what it looks like from underneath. A nice clean look here. And you could always use T111 plywood or 1x6 tongue and groove if you want a different look from the bottom. And I would also like to point out that if you do use half inch plywood here, expect all of your roofing nails and staples to come through the roof sheathing. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to use 3 quarter inch plywood. Or at the very least, while you're installing your roofing, come down 
down and take a look at what it looks like from the bottom after you've installed a couple of nails. And I am sure that I have plenty of more tips, but this video has ran way longer than most of my other videos, so I'm going to stop it right here. And if in this video, I will be providing you with a few examples for building a patio roof that will attach to the fascia board. And one of the reasons why this is a popular method of construction is because you don't need to rip off the roof. And that would include the roofing and some of the sheathing to attach the patio roof to the building. However, like most good things, this is also a patio that most building departments don't want to see. And the reason for that has to do with the connection to the fascia board. It does not usually create a strong enough connection. However, I will be providing you with a few methods and one method that I have never seen before, but thought about it when I was designing this. And for those of you who are familiar with my videos, I usually start with the finished product to provide you with an idea of what I am going to be designing and building here. So with that said, let's go ahead and remove some of the framing components like the roof rafters. And I am going to put a link here along with the title of a video that is going to provide you with more step-by-step -step instructions. I didn't want to make two videos and put all the information in both of the videos. So I highly recommend watching that. And of course, that will provide you with more information on how you can build the patio slab and figure out the height of the beam and attach the beam to the post and the post to the concrete foundation. And the reason why I have a level sitting up here is to provide you with some type of a slope that will be required. And that's usually going to be a minimum of a quarter of an inch per foot. And in the next step, I will provide you with a method that you can use to cut the angle for the roof rafters that's going to go up against the fascia board. And that can be done by lining the top of your square two by material, two by six, two by eight, whatever you're gonna be using with the top of the fascia board. And then while holding the roof rafter in place, you're simply going to grab a two by block. This is a two by four and then place one edge of it up against the fascia board so that you can mark it. So not too difficult. Top of the roof rafter with the top of the fascia board. And then we're simply going to trace a line right here. And that will be the line that we're going to use to cut our roof rafter so that we will be able to attach it to the fascia board. And I've seen this toe nailed. I've seen it in nailed to the fascia board. I will leave that up to you. Probably going to be better to use some hangers or some type of building hardware. And of course, I will provide you with an example of that here in a few seconds. And in our example here, we laid out the roof rafters at 16 inches on center, and they will need to be toenailed to the beam along with some blocks. And the blocks should also be attached to the beam. And then after that, we can install the fascia board on our 10 minute patio, huh? Wish it was this easy. And of course, I wanted to show you the difference here. You might need to notch a section of your fascia board because if you don't, it will look like this. Let's go ahead and take a close up look of that. So again, we just simply cut this so not too difficult you can grab a straight edge and place it up against the fascia board to get the line here or you can just simply cut a line whatever you feel like doing or you can leave it or in some cases you can raise the fascia board but I'm not going to go into that detail and then install your roof sheathing and you are done with your patio or should I say the patio framing because now it would be time to paint it and put the roof on. And for those of you looking for a little stronger connection, you can always use a hanger. And it's going to be better to notch the bottom of the roof rafter, something like this. However, I have seen people just simply put hangers on. And then, of course, there would be a gap here. And this will also depend upon the fascia board and the pitch of the roof. Because if you have plumb fascia board or fascia board that is vertically level, then you're going to be able to use a square 
square 90 degree angle here to make the connection. So again, not going to be just like the pictures in this video all the time. And for a better connection on this end, you might want to use two framing anchors. And you might even be able to use a hanger. However, I don't know if that's going to be the best option. And we can always use a strap to connect the patio to the existing roof. And it's probably going to be better to have the straps at least four foot on center minimum. And if the existing rafters are 16 inches on center, then you could line them up and have them on every rafter or on every other rafter. And again, that choice will be up to you. And as an alternative to something like this, this is the idea I was talking about where we have two rafters that line up and we could actually notch a small hole into the fascia board so that we could slide a strap through it and connect both the existing rafter to the new patio rafter with probably the longest strap possible. And you could always use a framing anchor or some other type of building hardware to get a better connection between the new fascia board and the existing fascia board. And now for another reason why people don't build these patios, and that's going to have to do with the headroom height. And of course, you would need to check with your local building department to verify what your local building codes are for the minimum headroom height for an exterior beam or a patio roof cover. And as you can see here, we are at six foot nine and a half inches if the building department requires six foot ten inches then you might need to make a smaller patio or somehow make some modifications to the floor to make your local building department happy now this of course is another reason why people don't build patios like this however I remember one time talking to someone who built aluminum patio covers and they were allowed to go a little bit lower and again that that would be something you would need to check with your local building department. So I hope. In this video, I will provide you with an example of how you can build a porch roof with a gable end on this side. This is six foot by six foot. And I'm going to do something a little different. This isn't a real common method. Uh, I don't see it used a lot, but it can actually provide you with something that could be a lot less work and uh, something that uh, you won't have to do a lot of structural repairs to your house. So what we're going to do is raise the porch this time. And I'm going to make other examples. I put I will put a playlist together when they are done and link them to the video here, either in the back or in the, in the video description page. But here you can see where the gable roof porch goes up a little higher it sits on top of the house it's really not sitting on top of the roof it's still sitting on top of the beams here a portion of it will be a small portion of it will be sitting on top of the roof but this way here you can keep your original fascia board and again if you don't like the design don't do this i'm just kind of thinking out loud here with something and you can see we got two four by six beams with a two by four rafter tie. You can see right here is where the rafters are going to go. A couple of um, post to beam connectors. And of course, this is simply going to sit, the beams are going to sit on top of the wall framing. Now, sometimes when we do a porch like this, we have the um, beams here, the supporting beams a little lower, and we notch them around the framing plates or we um, butt them up against the wall and use some type of a hanger support or, um, you know, we're, or, or we're still ending up notching the wall framing plates out for the beam. So, and again, I'll have more examples of that in other, in a future video. So here, just sitting on top of the wall framing plates, we don't need to um, remove all of the blocking. I just removed them here for viewing purposes to make sure that you could see how the beams were sitting on top of the wall framing plates. Now something else I need to point out here is that you might need a larger header. 
you can see here where I put a four by four support post underneath the wall or in the wall framing, but underneath the post. And over here, I put a couple of more two by fours, just nailed two two by fours together right here to help support the weight or distribute the weight from the um, porch beam down. So you might actually, if you have a four by four header, you might need to make, make it a four by six. And again, I'm just speculating here. Obviously, if you have a, um, you know, 12 foot opening here, and this is going to be in the middle of the opening and you have a four by 10 um, header or something like that, you know, you might need a six by 10. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. Be aware of that. When you are building your porch, be aware of what the beam, what the roof beam is actually going to be sitting on and how the load is going to be distributed through the wall framing down to the foundation. Now let's go ahead and pan away here, get a different view. We can see here how the post and the beams, everything is connecting together. This is going to be the core load bearing structure of our roof. And our plywood here, you're not going to need to remove your plywood. I say this, you might not need to. You might not need to remove all of it. It all depends on how you're going to be attaching the beam to the wall framing. So in this example here, you could cut an opening to where you can slide the beam um, through it. But how are you going to attach it on the other side? If that's going to be a problem, you might need to remove some of the wall sheathing. Let's go ahead and throw our roof rafters in there. We have two by six with a two by eight ridge and our fill area, our blocks two by six, and your rafters might need to be smaller or larger depending upon your project. Remember, this is not structural engineering. Um, I cannot tell everybody what size lumber to use on your project. Just kind of throwing something out there with some materials that might work for your project. If you have areas, you live in an area where it snows, these might need to be two by 10 for all I for all I know. Now we are going to need two um, rafter ties. I think I just had one in there originally, but I realized that I'm gonna need another one. Four foot on center is usually the code. And uh, unless you're gonna use it somehow, if you're gonna build a wall on top of this um, to um, put some siding on or something like that, then um, you might be able to get away with that. You might not need a rafter tie in there. Throwing out another view there. And the fascia board. Nice mitered cut there. Everything looks nicer on the computer. I shouldn't say everything. I'm sure there are skilled craftsmen out there that can make it look even nicer. Um, I, this is usually an inch to an inch and a half. This is allowed. This space here is so that you can run your roofing materials under it. So you might not need as much room for composition shingles. Maybe you only need a half inch. For tile, you might need two or three inches. That will all depend upon the roof. Usually in a situation like this, the roofing material goes underneath this section and then this stuff here goes on top so that all the water will transfer down and won't be a problem. No roof leaks. We don't want that. And you can see here what it looks like with the roof sheathing. Nice and tight here. The sheathing will nail into this nailer here and uh, probably finish something like this. And that, my friends, is the end of this video. So just so here is another video that might be helpful for anyone who's planning on building a porch extension like this and would like it to match up to the existing fascia board. And of course, the um, that's going to depend upon how large your rafters are, where you position everything. So pay attention here if uh, you're going to build something like this because the um, rafter size is what's going to help you create the same dimensions. For example, if you have a two foot overhang on the outside and you would like to have a two foot overhang on this side, then the rafters are going to need to be um, the same height. And uh, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a few seconds. Go ahead and take the sheathing off, roof rafters. Now I do have some videos. I'm gonna put some links um, in the video description box 
and on YouTube. And the first link will be for the original house if you wanted to see what that looked like. And the second link will be for a video that I just made about a month ago showing how to build this exact same porch but go on top of the roof, make it a little higher, go on top of the roof to make it a little easier for the homeowner. So here we go, here's the key here. The measurement right here from the outside corner of the beam straight up, let's just say it's four and a half inches. It needs to be exactly the same. Um, whatever the in, what the outside of the roof rafters are measuring. And in our case here, we have a truss roof. So the measurement from here to here needs to be the same. Let's just go back to it. As here we are on the outside, as from here to here, to match the fascia board. Now, if this is a little higher or a little lower, then your overhang is going to be a little smaller or a little longer. So if the existing house has a two foot over uh, overhang, then, and you want to keep it the same, then these, this measurement right here is going to be critical, going to have to be the same. It can be off a little bit, maybe even an eighth of an inch, but uh, other than that, it can start to push the fascia board out or in, depending upon how far off you are. Now, here's something else I want to point out. The other um, porch that I drew, the when you finish the wall, it could be finished a little different. This one here, I went ahead and removed the overhang and this comes underneath and we need to have some type of a wall that's even with the lower wall here and these roof rafters will provide us with that as long as we line up the face or the edge of the rafter with the wall framing because we might want to finish the top. It depends if you're going to put a ceiling on this, this isn't going to be important. If you're going to um, paint the bottom of the roof rafters. Maybe you're going to use plywood for your sheeting, maybe some one by six shiplap or TNG, something like that. And you need to finish the edge and it's going to have to be framed like this. Let's go ahead and take some of the plywood or the OSB away there. Give you an idea of how the valley rafter here is going to connect. And you might have to cut the existing roof framing like we did here and then install some blocks so that everything looks like it's part of the deal here. And you can always use two by four. I use two by six here. You can always use two by four. Just make sure that uh, it's the right height. And uh, the other end here. Now I did put some shaped blocks in here so that I could get the plywood nailing. Um, for the existing house, this is probably going to be a good idea. Toenail them into the framing plates. And of course, you can always use some building hardware. Some flat uh, A35s or Tico clips would be fine. Put the sheathing back in. Of course, this would need to be nailed. Perimeter nailing, possibly six inches on center, a view from above. We got two foot on center rafters with a one foot overhang, two foot overhang here, and our valley fill. Our ridge, our rafter ties, and I don't have any collar ties in something like this. It's, uh, you can put them in, you know, maybe you can always put a strap over it. Remember, a strap will do the same thing as a collar tie. Um, what strap? You know, I can't really provide you with that uh, information because why, for those of you who have been watching my channel long enough, because I don't like to give structural engineering information out that could get someone in trouble, especially me and you, if uh, you uh, don't really understand what I'm saying. Because I can provide people with structural engineering information. I just can't provide them with information that's going to work in every situation all around the world. So that's it here. In this video, I am going to provide you with a cost comparison between a couple of fences, or should I say the amount of boards required for an eight foot section of fencing. You can do your own math. I have no idea what the prices are in your area or what they're going to be in the future. 
However, by the time you finish watching this video, I think you're going to have a pretty good idea about whether or not you want to build a standard fence like this one here with gaps in the middle that your neighbors can see through, or whether you want to build a total privacy fence. And let's start with pointing out that this board here is eight foot long. And even though this board here starts even with it, this one here looks like it's a little bit short of it. And the same is going to hold true in the rest of the examples. So I'm not going to be providing you with specific spot on measurements in each one of the examples. So let's go ahead and start with a standard fence five and a half inch boards we have an eighth of an inch gap in the middle providing us with a fence that is going to require 17 fence boards in our next example we're going to build a privacy fence that is going to require 21 boards or four more fencing boards to create about an eight foot long section so we're simply going to install these boards here nine inches on center so the center of this board here to the center of this board is going to be nine inches and with that we're going to have a three and a half inch gap in between each board providing us with a one inch overhang on each side of this fencing board here, providing us with plenty of room to nail the fencing boards together and get a nail through this board, into this board, and then maybe into the other two by four also, and providing us with a fence you cannot see through. In our next example, we are going to space the fencing boards a little farther apart, providing us with a four inch gap in between each one of these boards here and a three quarter inch overlap on each side, still enough room to drive a nail through, even if you're going to be angling it. And of course, in this example here, we are going to use one board less. Here we're going to have 20 boards in about an eight foot span but we can't stop there let's go ahead and make the gap a little wider four and a half inches between each board providing us with a half inch overlap on each side now I'm going to leave it up to you as to how far apart you want to space your boards and how much money you want to save on your fencing project because this one right here only requires two more boards. We have 19 boards here. And in my area in the year 2022, the fence boards are about $3.50 each, providing you with an additional cost of about $7 more for total privacy if you're not interested in your neighbors looking through your fence. And the last thing I want to point out in this video is that I know a lot of people email me, they ask me questions about fencing, especially when it comes to some of my videos on the post holes, the concrete around the wood posts, and whether or not to use other materials. And the same thing holds true here. If you want to spend a few more dollars, you can usually create a stronger fence. And as I showed you in this video, a fence that will provide you with more privacy. So a lot of the questions that I end up answering in my videos and that are emailed to me usually have something to do with spending more money on your fence and what you're actually going to get as an end result. So hopefully that helps. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment area, along with any suggestions you might have about building better privacy fences.